Hey guys, today we have another crazy, crazy case. After his son's murder went unsolved, Francisco did the one thing that most would never in a million years expect. He infiltrated a local gang trying to find the people responsible for his son's murder. And Francisco became a national hero. It seems like, you know, something out of a movie plot, but I promise you this is real life. It really did happen. It was at 4.30 a.m. on 22nd of November 1995 that the taxi number 69 stopped at the Camp Red petrol station in La Constancia. La Constancia is actually a really bad or, if you will, a neglected neighborhood in the center of Jerez, Spain. The taxi driver stopped at pump number one and, you know, as you do, he got out of the car and he tried to fill it up, but the pump just wouldn't turn on. So the driver went to look for the attendant in the shop. And now before we carry on with today's video, let's just jump onto the Romanian word for today, which is benzinarie. 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 Well done guys, you just said petrol station. So so as the driver went towards this shop because the pump wouldn't work, he saw that the door of the shop was smashed. He went inside and there were magazines and papers all over the floor. Then the driver noticed something really, really gruesome. He saw what seemed to be blood all over the walls. He ran outside to a payphone to call the emergency services. Now, you also need to keep in mind that this was 1995 when the case took place. Mobile phones were just at the beginning, so very few people actually had them. Anyway, a few minutes go by before the municipal police arrives. Checking the store out, one of them found the trail of blood which they followed. This led to an office behind the cash register. Police tried opening the door, but it just didn't open, so they actually had to kind of force their way in. Behind the door, in this room, barricaded inside, behind the photocopier, a young man was lying motionless on the ground, bleeding a lot. However, this man was still breathing, so he was still alive. Five minutes later, a team of paramedics went into the office for assistance. They tried desperately to help him and to treat his wounds, and they were covered in blood and surrounded by medical equipment, but by 4.45 a.m., Juan Holgado was sadly deceased. Just after 5 a.m., Manuel Bitrago, the acting magistrate who would oversee the future criminal investigation, also arrived at the petrol station. Manuel was 41 years old and he never actually handled a murder case before, but he immediately ordered a thorough inspection of the premises. His inexperience with handling a murder case would prove disastrous in this case. Inside the shop, investigators found a large juice carton which was stained with blood, a button ripped from a raincoat and a pendant engraved with the sign of Virgo. They collected 22 fingerprints from the scene, however, at that stage, it was impossible to know if any of the fingerprint actually belonged to the attackers or to the customers who went to the petrol station that day. We need to remember that this was a petrol station with a shop. Even though this was now a murder scene, right? And you know, evidence needs to be preserved. This shop floor and the office where Juan was found were not closed off by police. You know, police line, do not cross that yellow big line stuff like that. So it wasn't actually closed off. The news of the murder very quickly spread and so the crime scene became increasingly chaotic. By 5.30 a.m. Manuel, the magistrate, found himself surrounded by paramedics, consultant criminologists, police officers and local journalists. So you can imagine that they were just walking all over each other and sometimes most importantly, they were walking all over the evidence. Investigators were even collecting crime scene debris without using any protective gloves. So straight away, I guess you can tell that the crime scene is compromised and the potential evidence is compromised. So everything is getting contaminated, which is not a really good thing for an investigation, right? 
At 5.50 a.m., Juan's body was inspected by a forensic scientist. The scientist found 30 stab wounds in total. Some of them were superficial slices across his face and hands, others were deep gashes to his chest and the back of his legs. The coroner later determined that they were inflicted by an 18 cm blade, like the ones used for carving Spanish ham. Manuel, the magistrate, kind of pictured in his mind and he believed that the violence of the attack suggested two or more male attackers. The records from the petrol station's cash register showed that someone bought the juice carton, remember the one I said at the beginning with the blood on, and a pack of cigarettes at 4.02 at a.m. The taxi driver found the scene at 4.30 a.m. So this would mean that it would be a window of opportunity of just half an hour. But there was also no CCTV footage and there were no witnesses. Prosecutors would later lay out what they believed happened. Juan's killers cornered him, slashing the backs of his legs so that he couldn't run away and then knocked him to the ground. Juan somehow managed to drag himself to the small office at the back of the shop, but the attackers forced their way in and continued stabbing him. There was no obvious motive for Juan's murder. Juan, who was 26 years old and was never in trouble with the law, was sadly in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's what they believed. He worked at this petrol station and he even swapped shifts with a colleague that night. His brother Paco was with him until around 2 a.m. to keep him company. He then left and Juan was alone. Born on 5th of October 1969, Juan was a hardworking and simple man. In his diary, he would always write about God. He saw many of his acquaintances fall into drugs, but he chose another path and studied psychology. Juan was also a soccer player and he dreamed of becoming a pro player he dabbled in modeling as well a bit and he was actually very religious. He was engaged to Pepe and he looked to have a promising life ahead of him. But sadly, that never happened. Manuel, the magistrate, remember him, suspected that Juan's attackers could be drug addicts. By the beginning of the 90s, Spain was the primary entry point for the cocaine trade in Europe and Jerez which was uh, 30 minutes northeast of the Bay of Cadiz on Spain's southern coast, began to suffer from drug-related crimes. There were a series of recent robberies in and around Jerez by the Harpoon Gang. Now, this Harpoon Gang was a criminal group which uh, specialized in attacks on petrol stations, but the work of this gang was efficient and professional which seemed like quite the opposite in Juan's case. The robbers who killed him seemed to be desperate and quite careless. They, ran, they ransacked the shop and they couldn't break open the station safe, stealing only 70,000 pesetas or 480 euros from the till, a couple of whiskey bottles and some tobacco. Six weeks after Juan's murder, finally law enforcement detained the first suspects. There were three. They were known criminals with a history of robbery and drug dealing. A fourth suspect was actually detained a few months later. Three of the four men had criminal records and all of the suspects were known to the police as consumers of hard drugs. However, they all denied the charges against them. The news of their arrests soon made it to the local press and on 15th of February 1996 it was said that the case was very close to being solved. But for Juan's father Francisco and his family this would be the beginning of a nightmare which never ended. When Francisco Holgado first, first found out about his eldest son Juan's death he just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that something like this could happen to them and their family. Francisco, who was 51 years old at the time, for most of his life he actually worked as a bank clerk. His neighbors and friends saw him as a respectable man in a normal middle class family. He had his wife, Antonia Castro, and he was the father to their three boys and a daughter. But the murder completely changed him. From a normal, ordinary man, he became one of extremes. In the months after Juan's murder, 
Spanish authorities really struggled to solve the case. This made Francisco obsessed with finding his son's murderers. Over the next two decades, his pursuit of justice just consumed his life. The Spanish press, when they found out about his story, they championed, they championed his cause and even gave him a nickname, Padre Coraje or Father Courage. The media portrayed him as a hero and a symbol of paternal love. But behind closed doors, Francisco's own family was falling apart and they would eventually abandon him. In the weeks following the murder, the Holgados became angrier and angrier at the lack of answers from the police, who promised the family a swift resolution. On 21st of December 1995, three weeks before the magistrate made his first arrests, the family gathered 3,000 people from all over the city for a justice march through Jerez's historic quarter. Friends, politicians and strangers paraded through the streets of the old town while neighbors yelled encouragement from windows and shop fronts. The savagery of Juan's murder shook many of the inhabitants of Jerez to the core where, even though there were drug problems in the city's poorer barrios or neighborhoods, a conservative Catholic gentility still dominated the atmosphere. People would say that he could have been their son. As the investigation dragged on through the spring and summer of 1996, with the prospects of a trial looking further and further away, the Holgados stepped up their, their demonstrations. Francisco would visit the local constabulary every day to get the latest updates, and he would often join Antonia, his wife, in front of the magistrate's court where they would protest next to a large poster criticizing Manuel's decision to release the defendants on bail. On the 22nd of every month, they would have a rally in the city's main square calling for justice for their son. From the moment it started, this official investigation into Juan's murder was just a disaster. According to Jose Luis Fernandez Monterubio, the head of the Jerez police, later said that, quote, the police entered the crime scene like bulls in a china shop, end of quote. In autumn of 1996, senior murder investigators from Seville joined the case and they found even more mistakes made by the local police. Crucial evidence like the bloody juice carton was lost and it came to light that several witness testimonies were made under the arrest. The local paper started criticizing the police as well and attacked Manuel Bitrago, claiming that he was sanctioned by the Spanish Ministry of Justice for the unnecessarily long time he took to investigate two previous cases. Manuel would later say that the criticism of the Jerez police were exaggerating, telling the local TV channel La Sexta, whoever arrived at the crime scene that day would have done the same thing. It was the way cases were worked back then. Um, I'm not so sure that's entirely true because they didn't even steal the crime scene. When visiting his son's grave, Francisco promised him that he will see his case through to the end, no matter what he would need to do, regardless of the consequences. If the police wouldn't solve the case, Francisco decided that he would. Two years after Juan's murder, by the beginning of 1997, Francisco had started living a double life. Every weekday morning at 6 a.m. he was picked up by a bus to his office in Seville, which was 60 miles away. He would sleep on the bus, then work at the bank until late in the afternoon, and then he would come home just for a change of clothing. A few nights a week, he would actually go out through Rompe Chapines, which was at some point a really nice area of Jerez, but he later sadly turned into a drug neighborhood. Francisco was desperate to find out some kind of information related to the murder of his son Juan and, you know, anything really, any kind of information. He would be out on the streets until the early hours of the morning. He would even go to smoky bars and brothels in abandoned townhouses which were known to be frequented by pimps. The visits were usually not planned by Francisco, they were just in the spur of the moment and he would just go in the spur of the moment. But, you know, Francisco, he could be an impulsive man, so it wasn't really out of character for him. As he said, when he was in his 20s, 
Stationed in North Africa on military service, he slapped a superior officer across the face during a game of football because the superior was rude to him. And even after he became a father, he always took opportunities, even though this would cause tensions at home. Whilst living in Jerez, he and the family moved around quite a lot, more than 10 times in 10 years, because he was always trying to find bigger and better houses for the family. Over time, Francisco, in his pursuit for justice, became more and more organized and he actually started looking into leads that he would pick up in the local press or from police officers that he was friendly with. When he would visit the crack dance in Rompe Chapines, Francisco would have long chats with junkies, convincing them by offering cigarettes or tablets of tranquilium, a tranquilizer prescribed for, for the chronic anxiety that himself, that he, Francisco, was experiencing since Juan's death. So Francisco would actually give his own medication away just to try and get some kind of information regarding his son, any kind of information. Whilst these people that he would be talking with would get high, Francisco would record everything on a Sanio dictaphone that he carried in a plastic shopping bag. At one point, Francisco even tried to interrogate a drug dealer, but this drug dealer actually threatened to, pull a hole, to put a hole in his chest with an industrial road drill if he didn't stop asking questions. But Francisco was willing to risk everything, including his life. When you would usually spend time with your family on weekends, for example, Francisco instead, he would be spending his time reviewing the recordings that he would take during his conversations. And he actually got quite disappointed by them. They were only meaningless names, fancy stories, and just dead ends. Francisco thought that the reason he's getting nowhere was actually because of his local fame. His face was plastered across front pages, his bravery in the face of tragedy repeatedly appreciated in El Diario de Jerez and his voice broadcast to listeners of the local radio station. Francisco at one point even tried using fake names, but this didn't actually work because he would be recognized. Towards the end of 1997, one afternoon, whilst Francisco was at a cafe in the barrio of Asuncion, a tall man with messy hair and a run-down looking suit approached him. This man introduced himself as Pepe el Gitano, Pepe the Gypsy. He told Francisco that he had some really important news related to Juan's case and if he wants to hear the news, they would need to meet later at a secret location. Francisco actually agreed and, you know, he got everything organized, but Pepe El Gitano never actually showed up at the meetup point. At this point, after months of investigating, Francisco was already used to disappointments like this, but for some reason, Pepe El Gitano actually stayed in his mind. So, he had a light bulb moment. Ding! In the underworld of Jerez, people appeared and disappeared all the time. So, why couldn't Francisco do just the same? So, at the end of March 1998, Francisco was in the queue of a methadone clinic in the Asuncion neighborhood. He was dressed up in a leather jacket, baggy jeans and a blue denim shirt and large tortoise shell sunglasses. He also wore a medium-length wig with dark brown hair parted at the side. He had to, you know, look the part. So what did Francisco do? He introduced himself as Pepe and he began striking up conversations with addicts by offering 50,000 peseta reward for an imaginary lost dog called Rufo. Or this would be the equivalent of around $500, you know, a reward for this imaginary dog, Rufo. After he had met Pepe El Gitano, Francisco decided that rather than interviewing people at random, he will focus his missions on the four official suspects who were already charged with murder, but whose trial was not scheduled until the following year, so in 1999. 
He believed that the police had the right attackers, but he didn't really trust the police to uncover the necessary evidence to get a conviction. Francisco knew that it would just be impossible to follow all four of them at once, all four of the suspects, and because Francisco, he was just one person. The suspects were in similar circles, but they barely actually knew each other, according to one of them. Two of the men were in and out of prison for other crimes, and another suspect was difficult to track down. At some point, Francisco found out through local newspaper reports that the fourth suspect, Pedro Asensio, stayed in Jerez since the murder, which was the requirement of his bail conditions. He was living at the house of his blind father in Asuncion. Pedro Asensio, who was 35 years old, had a long history of heroin abuse and petty crime, and people who knew him told Francisco that Pedro can be unpredictable and violent. So, Francisco went on to find this Pedro and he actually found him. He found Pedro at the methadone clinic uh, standing in the queue with his hands shaking from withdrawal. So Francisco offered him a Transilian tablet and a cigarette to kind of ease his nerves. They struck up a conversation and Francisco told Pedro that he would get him more drugs if he wanted. As the months went on, Francisco, always posing as Pepe, tried to meet up with Pedro even more. He would offer him lifts in his car to visit his friends, to buy drugs and even to see his daughter who was living with his ex-wife outside of Jerez. Pedro didn't drive so this was actually quite good for him. And also Pedro, for some reason, was usually a very suspicious person. He was really and truly charmed by Francisco. He later told the newspaper El Mundo that he was looking for ways to kind of make quick money so that he could take care of his daughter and what Pepe, aka Francisco, was offering him was exactly what he was looking for. The more time they spent together, the more elaborate Francisco's fake identity became. He told Pedro that he was connected to a gang which moved large quantities of cocaine through the north. He even got the help of another local junkie, Jaime Monge Rodriguez, who, using the nickname Carlos, posed as Francisco's gang contact. Almost two months into Francisco's undercover operation as Pepe, Pedro told him that he suspected Domingo Gomez and Francisco Escalante, the other defendants, were involved in the murder at the petrol station. Pedro said that he saw Domingo give Francisco Escalante a bag of bloody clothing to throw in the bin just a few days after the murder. Apparently, when Francisco Escalante, the suspect, saw the bag with the bloody clothing, freaked out and he started yelling at Domingo to just get rid of it. Pedro told Pepe, aka Francisco, Juan's father, that he didn't have any involvement in the crime itself. Domingo Gomez and Francisco Escalante have also always maintained their complete innocence. By mid-1998, Pepe and Pedro were meeting two or three times a week. Around the same time, Francisco quit his job at the bank because he just couldn't work and investigate his son's murder at the same time. He was suffering really badly with anxiety, so he was on antidepressants, but his relationship with his family was becoming increasingly strained. Even before Juan's death, his marriage was fragile. Now, however, things were deteriorating because of grief as well, with Antonia's feelings about her husband's late-night trips varying from day to day. Sometimes Antonia would encourage her husband, but other times she just couldn't understand why Francisco went to such extremes. She also wanted justice for Juan, but Francisco always made things unnecessarily difficult and he had to do them his way no matter what, according to Antonia. Their son Paco, who occasionally went with Francisco on his lead hunting, agreed with his mother. This was before Francisco started disguising, disguising himself. This, this guy, this guy, this guy. Okay, you get it. This was before Francisco actually started, you know, changing his appearance. Paco believed that uh, his father's new attempts to try and find out the truth were too dangerous and simply useless. The only other person who knew of Francisco's double life was the family's lawyer, 
Juan Pedro Cosano, who was actually supportive. He believed that this was an extraordinary act of love and bravery. But by this point, Francisco's life, like I said, was just coming apart. But he was also in danger. According to him, one day that summer, Pedro told Pepe, aka Francisco, that he was going to kill Juan Holgado's father. He heard the rumor that Francisco Holgado, tired of repeated delays in his son's case, bought a shotgun and was going to hunt him down. Pedro said that he would get to the old man first. But Pedro had absolutely no idea that Pepe was Francisco, the same man that he said he will kill. Hearing this, Francisco was quite shocked and in a moment of panic, he actually offered to do the job himself. Him, as Pepe, told Pedro that he would murder Francisco Holgado to save Pedro from getting into more trouble. Francisco later said that he saved his own life by proposing to kill himself, essentially. Now, going back to the police investigation, even though there were a lot of errors in Juan's death investigation, they eventually built up enough evidence to bring to trial the four original suspects including Pedro Asensio, who had been arrested six weeks after the murder of Juan. In the days before the trial, Francisco sat down with his lawyer to sort through the 12 tapes that Francisco recorded during the eight months that he was undercover as Pepe. Francisco knew that this might cause legal problems, but for him, this was a necessary risk. He needed to get as much information as he could from Pedro. Francisco's lawyer decided to hold the tapes back for the element of surprise in court. They knew it was going to be a difficult trial and they needed to use every trick that they could think of. On Monday, 11th of January 1999, the four defendants entered Cadiz's Audiencia Provincial courtroom in handcuffs for the first day of the trial. When he was called to speak, Pedro Asensio naturally denied his involvement in the murder or any kind of connection to Juan Holgado. After a few more questions, Francisco's lawyer asked Pedro if he knew that the person who went by the name of Pepe was in fact the father of Juan Holgado, Francisco. By his reaction, clearly Pedro had no clue. Then, the lawyer announced that Francisco recorded hours of his secret conversations with Pedro. Everyone in the courtroom was astonished. Francisco's lawyer said, quote, It's a moment I will never forget. The look on Asensio's face when I told him, the reaction from the gallery when I mentioned the tapes, it was like something out of a Hollywood film. End of quote. Later on, in a 2003 interview with El Mundo, Pedro Asensio claimed that he had known of Pepe's real identity before the trial. Although, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't think I believe him considering the reaction he had in court. He was red-faced when Francisco's lawyer laid everything out. After the recording's revelation, the judges said that they would need time to consider if the evidence of the audio collected by Francisco was admissible. In the meantime, as the trial went on, the critical importance of the tapes became clear. There was a lack of physical evidence, like fingerprints or any traces of blood, to tie the suspects to the murder on the stand, Several key witnesses retracted their earlier statements, including a prostitute who had confessed to seeing the blood-soaked suspects the night of the murder. Then, on the fourth day of the trial, the judges announced their decision on the tapes. The tapes would not be admitted as evidence because they lacked legal guarantees of authenticity or integrity. Now, the case for the prosecution was looking bad. Francisco Holgado went undercover to solve his son's murder, made friends with one of his son's alleged killers, and even pledged to kill himself in order to save his own life. And nothing came of it. Halfway through the trial, Francisco Holgado became a household name across Spain. But this would come with a price. On Sunday, 17th of January, El Mundo published a profile of Francisco Holgado with the headline Padre Coraje. 
The article written by a local journalist, Pepe Contreras, spoke about the virtues of a father who risked his own life to get justice for his son. Pepe Contreras spoke with Francisco at his home, focusing on Francisco's composure in the face of danger and the rage that allowed him to meet Pedro Asensio day in and day out. This article turned the Holgado family into celebrities. At the time, Antonio, Antonia, apart from dealing with the death of her son, Juan, was also recovering from illness. Then, her husband becomes a national hero, a media sensation, with the media camped outside their house, hoping to get an interview with Padre Coraje. Spain's biggest newspapers and TV channels all wanted to hear Francisco's story. And the foreign press as well. The Argentinian broadsheet El Clarín published an article about the case describing how an Andalusian bank clerk had pretended to be a criminal to seek justice, not vengeance, for his deceased son. Francisco seemed to be brilliant in front of the microphone and he never objected from talking about the details of his own bravery. In court the following week, the defense and the prosecution rested their cases and the judges retired to consider their verdict. On 9th of February, while Francisco Holgado was speaking with Portuguese journalists who started making a documentary about the case, the judges announced their verdict. All of the defendants were acquitted. Francisco was simply devastated, but now he had something very important. The nation's attention. On 20th of February, while his lawyer launched an appeal in the courts, Francisco did something unbelievable. He locked himself in the petrol station where his son had died, threatening to burn the place to the ground if the company didn't provide safer working conditions for the employers. Along with uh, his daughter Maria, he also got graffiti up on public buildings with slogans like Juan Holgado's murderers still at large in the street and justice for Juan Holgado. But it was at this point that the Holgados were really coming apart. Paco and his siblings sometimes felt that their, that their father Francisco was being consumed by guilt at being emotionally absent in the years before Juan's death. Paco said that Francisco was never affectionate with his children before Juan passed away. Now he was absent yet again, immersing himself first in his undercover investigations and then in talking to journalists. He barely noticed when his son Paco left for Germany to work in a casino at the beginning of 1998. And he failed to notice how much his other children were actually struggling to cope with their brother's murder. Antonia, Francisco's wife, felt that in interviews with the media, her husband exaggerated his bravery. She would later claim that he never actually put himself at as much risk as people say. When he went to meet with Pedro Asensio, he was always with someone else, even when he said he was alone. She also believed that he lied about the unity within the family, and stole the spotlight for himself rather than shining it on Juan's case. Antonia as well campaigned relentlessly for justice, organizing marches and visiting the police station almost every day, but she never actually wanted recognition in the media for her sacrifices. In early 2000, the tensions between Francisco and his family reached an exploding point when Francisco sold the rights to a book and a TV drama based on Juan's case. While Francisco traveled to Madrid to negotiate the contract with the national TV channel Antena 3, Antonia was in hospital, receiving treatment for an embolism in her lung. She didn't agree with the idea of a film, but because of her stay, because of her hospital stay and her health problems, she was really powerless to stop it. Francisco told his family that he only made the deal because the TV channel said he would shoot a film with or without his consent, but the family didn't quite believe him. After this deal, Francisco came home with 6 million pesetas from the deal, which was around 36,000 euros. Antonia accused him of taking advantage and 
of taking advantage of the family suffering and selling his own son's death. The film, which was called Padre Coraje, was first broadcast in March of 2002. It depicted the Holgados as a family guided through their suffering by a brave, humble patriarch who had rubbed shoulders with a lurid cast of characters from Spain's underworld in order to hunt down his son's killers. Pedro Asensio believed that the interpretation of Francisco's character was greatly exaggerated. Antonia couldn't even bring herself to watch the film, but she saw the consequences. Her life and her suffering were the subject of gossip all over Jerez. People were entertained by her loss. Now, going back to the appeal in court, remember that there was an appeal? Right, in 2000, the Supreme Court of Spain accepted the family's appeal and granted a retrial. You remember those tapes? Through October and November 2003, Francisco Holgado's tapes were played to a full house in the same courtroom where his son's alleged killers had been tried and acquitted almost five years earlier. The same four suspects sat on the same bench, but now the public gallery was packed, not only with the local newspapers, but with journalists from El País and El Mundo and TV cameras from all the leading channels. Francisco Holgado was at the back of the courtroom and, and this time he was confident that things will go well. But what was on the tapes, however, wasn't exactly very helpful. You would think that, you know, it would be wow, amazing. There were actually hours of drunken slurs in bars and hard to understand mumbles in the back of cars. Even if Francisco made himself friends with Pedro, to get more information, Pedro never actually confessed to the crime. So the prosecution really struggled to actually put together a credible narrative from, from these recordings. I mean, come on, you would think that prosecution would check these recordings before, you know, actually going through with the appeal and everything because the appeal was more or less based on the admittance issues of these tapes, but, you know, it seems that this wasn't the case. They weren't really checked properly. And on 3rd of December, the four suspects were acquitted of murder yet again. Francisco Holgado and Antonia eventually divorced in 2004, but they continued to lash out at one another with arguments in public. Antonia told the papers that, who, uh, that her husband never loved Juan and that he was a bad father. All three of the children sided with their mother and they gradually broke off contact with Francisco, who claimed that the children were turned against him by Antonia. After their separation, Antonia and Francisco, they began to campaign individually. In 2006, the Supreme Court rejected a second appeal for a retrial of the same defendants. Antonia started a series of hunger strikes outside the petrol station where Juan's murder took place, while Francisco again painted slogans on government buildings and police stations. Both Antonia and Francisco continued to visit the police station every week for updates on the case, and they both spent time offering support to other families who had lost children to violence. With no new evidence or a new trial, the public and the press lost interest in the Holgados, which, you know, is to be expected, really. This made Francisco feel empty and alone. When the press lost interest, Francisco felt that he had to strive even harder to catch their attention to be deserving of the name Father Courage. On 23rd of December 2008, Francisco Holgado stepped onto the tracks at the Jerez Central Station. In front, in front of a stationary Barcelona-bound train, he laid out a large white poster which read Juan Holgado, 22nd of November 1995. 13 years without Juan, 13 years without justice. Police and judges useless. Why? He then sat on the track for 40 minutes, accompanied by a few local sympathizers, until he was dragged off the tracks by the police. Less than a month later, on 11th of January 2009, 
30 minutes into the first half of a La Liga football match between uh, Exerez and Tenerife, Francisco skipped over the barriers of the spectators' area and ran onto the pitch. He carried a white carnation and the same white poster. In front of 7,000 fans and national TV cameras, two senior players, one from each side, escorted him off the pitch to rounds of applause. The captain of XRS told the Canal TV after the match that Francisco needed to be supported because he suffered a huge loss. Francisco would do the same thing at another match the following year. In May 2009, the police closed Juan's case, citing a lack of new evidence. The local papers wrote about this like it would be the end of the story. But for Antonia and Francisco, the story would not be over until the killers were behind bars. In October 2015, Francisco Holgado arrived in Madrid on foot, limping slightly and wearing a white t-shirt with a portrait of his son. By this point, Francisco was 71 years old. He walked uh, approximately 600 kilometers or 370 miles from Jerez on busy motorways and dusty country roads to seek an audience with the acting minister of justice, Rafael Cataya. In the last six years, there was no new evidence and Francisco himself had been suffering from heart problems and he even tried to sue Antonia for harassment after taking a restraining order out on her in 2009. He never gave up campaigning for his son, but making an impact became more difficult. The date of his son's case was almost reaching the statute of limitations, which for murder is 20 years. Francisco knew that he had to do something dramatic. Of course, that Francisco could fly to Madrid to see the minister, but he wanted to get attention. And so in early 2015, he came up with the idea of a justice march. But Francisco didn't want just a march for Juan. In his mind, this would be a protest for all the families caught in limbo who still didn't know the identity of the criminals who had killed their loved ones. Francisco's lawyer, Jose Miguel Ayon, who replaced his other lawyer at the second trial, helped Francisco to get in touch with other parents who were in a similar situation, people that he could meet on his way to Madrid. Two volunteers who worked for the New Day charity in Carmona near Seville set up a Facebook page for Francisco's project and the coordinated with their contacts in town halls throughout Spain so that he would be met by someone in each place that he stopped. On 28th of September, at the roundabout by the petrol station where Juan lost his life, Francisco began his walk north through Seville, Cordoba and Toledo and Toledo on his way to the capital, to Madrid. On the road, he was followed by well-wishers, local politicians from the towns he passed through, and photographers from La Voz del Sur, El Pai, and Interview Magazine. On Facebook, 30,000 people followed his progress, receiving daily updates on his page, Support Father Courage. According to his ex-wife, Antonia, this was very typical to Francisco. He was over the top and exaggerated. She felt it was just too much about him rather than Juan, their son. But Francisco, he actually achieved what he wanted, because in October, he sat down in a room in the Ministry of Justice in Madrid with his lawyer and the minister, Rafael Cataya. Rafael Cataya was sympathetic to Francisco's pleas and told him that even though he couldn't keep Juan's case open forever, he promised that he will have it looked over. Five days before the statute of limitations would expire, the investigation was actually passed from the National Police to the Guardia Civil, Spain's oldest law enforcement agency, which even though was organized as a military force, it was still performing police duties. Within days of this investigation, there was an apparent breakthrough. A fingerprint on the Casper Tetra brick, the blood-stained juice carton found at the scene, the last purchase made, which was previously discarded as evidence because it didn't match the criteria for testing at the time, was matched to Agustin Morales, aka El Gata, a well-known drug addict and serial offender who, at the time of Juan's murder, lived near the petrol station. 
but it then came to light that Agustin died in prison in 2006. He had been dead for a decade and it wasn't possible to interrogate his brother. Juan's murder investigation was, like I said, a disaster from the get-go. The fingerprints found at the gas station were initially analyzed with expired products, so everything just went to waste. Even today, in the university criminalistics classes held at the Jerez campus, it continues to be discussed. Only 20 fingerprints were collected at the gas station. None of them coincided with those of the four accused. The medal with the sign of Virgo was the other proof. It wasn't possible to prove that it belonged to Domingo Gomez, aka Dominguin. The blood on his jacket didn't incriminate him either. The biological remains were from the drug addict himself and not from Juan. According to Juan's mother, Antonia, the crime was committed in the warehouse. She said that it was the police who actually broke the glass of the door to get in. All the blood prints that were found at the gas station were from the footprints of all the people who went in to see what happened at the gas station who brought the blood to the shop floor. Only with the reopening of the case in 2016, it was possible to identify the footprint of Elgata or Agustin Morales on the juice box, which was kept for years. Juan's autopsy determined that the attacks were done with two different weapons. In the chest, one of the stab wounds was 18 centimeters. There were cuts on Juan's back and buttocks. Forensics assured that the work was professional. In a last attempt in June 2016, the court ordered that the 22 remaining fingerprints and DNA samples from Juan's clothing could be analyzed again. The fingerprints included in the original investigation were not checked against an international criminal database of the 190 member countries of Interpol. The judge also requested that Juan Holgado's clothing be examined for traces of blood and DNA and a separate trace of DNA which was found on a shard of glass at the crime scene was also to be re-examined. I guess that after so long, since Juan's murder in 1995, there were obvious advances in technology so they could work with resources that they just didn't have at the time. The Holgados knew that this was their last chance after 20 years of disappointments and suffering. Toward the end, towards the end of 2016, the Holgados learned that none of the court's new inquiries created a breakthrough. Yet another disappointment. Out of the 22 fingerprints, 11 were too indistinct to be analyzed and the rest didn't correspond to anyone on the Interpol database. Also, the court found that Juan's clothing had been destroyed 10 years earlier by judicial order and the DNA revealed no positive match. The local press yet again announced that the crime at the petrol station was closed. In 2017, even though Francisco's health was failing, he said that he would walk from Jerez to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg if he had to do it. He just wouldn't give up. He said there has to be another way and he's going to find it. By this point, Francisco wasn't even sure if Pedro Asensio, who was, in, who was in and out of prison over the past decade, or the other three original suspects were even at the petrol station that night in 1995. For Francisco, this wasn't about justifying his past actions or proving that he was right all along, but rather this was about justice for his son and he was clear that he is not going to stop until he has that justice. After so long, since 1995, Francisco doesn't even remember his normal old life. It's as if he was someone else's. He believes that the old Francisco died with his son. He lived with his son's story for so long that he's not even sure that he would know what to do without it. There are various theories as to what happened to Juan Holgado. Juan went to work as always that night in November 1995 with his thermos and the donuts that Antonia, his mom, prepared for him. Juan worked in dangerous gas stations before, but Antonia wasn't worried when Juan went to the gas station that night. He didn't have problems with anyone and nothing ever happened to him. According to Antonia, the people closest to Juan were not investigated including Bernardino, who was supposed to be the one working that night. 
Antonia says that there are other explanations. There was nothing stolen. The blood was brought from the warehouse to the gas station. Juan wasn't killed there. Juan's mother points out that until now, nothing truly was written about what happened. She believes that Bernardino must have had something to do with it. Otherwise, why would he leave town? The judicial process accused the four people, Pedro Asensio, Francisco Escalante, Domingo Gomez and Manuel Sanudo. They were drug addicts and habitual criminals from Jerez, but they always denied their involvement in the case. They were acquitted on two occasions. They were only accused because a woman told the police that she was partying with them in Rompe Chapines on the night of the murder, but at the trial she recanted. Francisco's lawyer, Juan Pedro Cosano, now says that the accused didn't even fit the profile. They never found Pedro Asensio's fingerprints at the gas station. Everyone's whereabouts are unknown. One of them died, Pedro Asensio is in Seville, and Domingo's relatives believe that he is in prison. In Jerez, though, they are still identified as those who killed Juan Horgado. Pedro Asensio's daughter is still the girl of the one who killed Juan. Pedro's brother was murdered with a guitar and knife blows in the La Asuncion neighborhood in 2019 and it was said that he died the brother of the one who killed Juan Horgado. Pedro criticized Francisco Horgado in the pages of Cronica saying that he is only looking for money and fame. Pedro always defended his innocence even when his ex-wife in the middle of a divorce and fighting for custody of his daughter, stated that he confessed to her what happened at the gas station. But, you know, again, we can't really be sure if he really said that or if his ex-wife said it because of the custody issue. Very little was known about Bernardino, for example, the man who swapped shifts with Juan. He studied at the La Salle school in Jerez and requested a transfer to Valladolid after what happened at the gas station. From Valladolid, he was sent to the gas station at the entrance to Jerez, then to a small town in the mountains, Cadiz, and then to another. Antonia still suspects that he was immersed in shady affairs and believes that this change was not accidental. She wonders if perhaps the robbers were going after Bernardino instead of Juan to settle some kind of scores, which is, you know, quite reasonable to believe really and it sounds plausible as well. Another name is Yolanda Castro Pacheco. She said that she was parting with the four defendants on 22nd of November 1995. Antonia thinks that Yolanda was somehow protected because she was the family of Pedro Pacheco, who was the mayor of the city for 24 years. She was a drug addict and she worked as a prostitute at the time, according to what was published. The sources consul consulted by El Español, however, denied this theory. According to sources familiar with the case, she was a scapegoat and she was pressured to testify. As of 2020, she was in Barcelona already rehabilitated. A flamenco artist was also mentioned. Nanio de Jerez, a singer still with an active career, was at the gas station that night. He was the first to set foot on the scene after the crime. He stopped, saw something strange and he ran away scared. He only raised the alarm when he stopped to refuel at the next gas, at the next gas station and told the clerk that he was robbed at Martin Ferrador's. You see, that same night there was a robbery at another gas station in Jerez and the clerk told Nanyo that the police were already there because the clerk was confused as to which of the gas stations were being mentioned. Finally, it was the taxi driver who raised the alarm. The taxi driver actually passed away years ago. His wife, also deceased, told a friend from the La Grania neighborhood that she didn't want to know anything about what happened because she worked in the taxi at night and she didn't want to get hurt. Juan Holgado's brothers, Paco, Maria and Antonio, still live in Jerez. Pepe, who was Juan's fiancé at the time, had a fight with her father because she took off her mourning before he believed it was appropriate. 
Juan Pedro Cosano, the family's lawyer, put all of his lawyers in charge of the private prosecution. His firm became fully involved. He believed that the person who killed Juan was Agustin Morales, El Gata, who lived in La Constancia, right in front of the gas station, and he actually fit the profile of a dangerous criminal. But after almost 29 years, it's not known who or for what reasons stabbed Juan Holgado 33 times. For the family, this crime was a true drama, which also caused his parents, Anton Antonia Castro and Francisco Holgado, to divorce. The couple couldn't overcome the fact that after two trials, the four accused, Pedro Asensio, Francisco Escalante, Domingo Gomez Franco, and Manuel Jesus Sanudo were acquitted. Francisco, Juan's father, said, quote, I swear that I will not rest until I know who or who killed my son in such a savage way that morning. I'm not going to die with that doubt. End of quote. And sadly, guys, this is all I have for you. There is absolutely no closure to Juan's murder. Now, I have a question, though. What do you think of Francisco? Did he really want to find out what happened to Juan? Or he was in it just for the fame and money? From my point of view, he did what he needed to do in order to get exposure to his son's case. Antonia maybe wanted to be more private and do things her own way. And, you know, she did. Francisco, maybe he saw all these exaggerations as a way to get attention and keep Juan's case in the public eye. Honestly, media, newspapers and social media are very powerful tools. If you are, you know, willing to kind of kick away all of your privacy. I, um, I don't fully agree with everything that Francisco did, but it got him to keep his son's murder in the public eye for a very long time. His methods worked. But sadly, there is still no answer as to what happened. And I think that in this case, Francisco acted in any way he could possibly do just to keep the, his son's case in the news, in the media. Please, guys, let me know what do you guys think in the comment section down below. For now, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!